Chelsea have had a, a strange season. After spending a lot of money in the transfer market, they currently sit mid-table in the Premier League and just recently lost to Klopp's kids in the League Cup final, with uh, the future of Pochettino's job a little uncertain. But today, I'm joined by Liam Toomey, John McKenzie and JJ Bull to discuss something a little more positive. When will they be good? OK, well, in order to answer that question, I think we first need to define what Chelsea even are right now. And I think in comparison to other big teams, Manchester City, Liverpool, for example, it seems that fans would have like a good idea of what those teams are about. They would identify philosophies, whether or not they actually exist with those teams. With Chelsea, it seems to be a lot more about what happens off the pitch rather than on the pitch, John. Yeah, I think you're right. Most fans would want to feel as though when they're talking about their club's identity, they're talking about what's actually happening on the pitch. But with Chelsea... I think a lot of the fans have always been talking about the off-pitch stuff because mm. ever since Clear Lake Capital took over the club, um, they've talked about this as an investment asset. So they, they spent around £4 billion, pounds committing £4 billion pounds of funds to buy the, the club. And the whole idea behind that seems to be, let's make this club worth more money. Let's get it up to £10 billion pounds worth as an asset and then we can sell it on and we'll make money that way. Mm. That has bled onto everything that's happened since then. And so I think what we talk about when we talk about Chelsea is them buying lots of young players, yeah. spending a lot of money on those players, but amortizing their value out over long contracts as a sort of smart business investment. But obviously, I think the off-pitch stuff has then bled onto the field and that is causing Chelsea to be not playing particularly well at the moment. Yeah. Liam, I mean, they didn't spend very much money in January, although fans, I think, would still categorize them as a club that just spend a lot on young, exciting players. How's that going as, a, as an approach? Are there indications that it's changing at all? Is anyone scared? Well, they didn't buy anyone in January. It was loans in and loans out. Um, so we have seen the handbrake applied on what I'd say is front-loaded investment. I think that's how Clear Lake and Todd Bowley would, would describe it. It's less that we're going to spend everything forever. Uh, it's more that we're going to spend sort of three or four years' money mm -hmm kind of up front um, in the hope of, well, clearly not being mid-table in the Premier League. Um, I think they were hoping to maybe put a bit of rocket fuel into the asset, as it right. were. Would they, would they have been expecting more at this point? That seems fair to say. More than we've seen, yeah. I think, they, uh, I, I think the initial calculation was underestimating how competitive the Premier League is. And I think they felt that they could do this massive accelerated rebuild, this huge squad overhaul at the same time as they're replacing uh, key staff in all aspects of the club mm. um, without dropping out of the top four. And yeah. clearly that was exposed very quickly as, as folly. Um, and so missing out on the Champions League last season was not in the plan. Missing out on the Champions League this year is definitely not in the plan. Yeah. Uh, so I think European qualification is a, is a big target for them still, even though they missed one opportunity with the Carabao Cup final. It's always fun to look at a plan in retrospect, isn't it? And if we do that now, JJ, with on the pitch, as John said earlier, the plan hasn't translated. Do they have a clear identity? When you watch them, do you understand what Pochettino is trying to do with them? Can you summarise it? Um, sort of. It's a very basic... Well, it looks like a 4-2-3-1. They have a goalkeeper and 10 other players on the pitch. <laughs> and they use the ball to pass it between them to try and put it into the opponent's goal. Yeah. As are the rules. Um, like Pochettino's Spurs team, a lot of the, the teams, like they, they like to press high. They're quite high. In, well, their PPDA or passes per defensive action, which measures your pressing intensity, is quite, quite good. So they like to try and stop people from playing out. They like to play through the lines. They tend to have one player drops in and gives them... Uh, like, like a pivot player, so maybe Casido does that, and then they like mm. to play through this, but they normally go out wide, and then they start to play with the ball in the middle after the first phase of build-up. Is it very different to what he did with Spurs? <laughs> Not really. It's, I mean, he likes to say he started playing a, a back three, and he had um, it's like Chelsea became like a back three kind of team when Conte did it in sixteen seventeen, yeah. and that's kind of been what I think almost like their identity was that kind of back three shape and playing mostly in the counter because you tend to have to yeah. in a back three system. And maybe for personnel reasons as well, right? I think so. Chelsea they, seem to have 17 defenders every season. They have about 13 centre-backs yeah. and you can't play them all at once because as, as I've described already, you can only have 10 outfield players yeah. at once. So they have to have just two at the moment because he's playing a two mm. back. Um, but he has changed from that three, which is what he kind of inherited. Um, and like Chelsea have dipped between different systems when they took Sarri in after Conte, he changed to a different kind of system. And then Lampard 
dithered between two different systems. Yeah. Pochettino, it seems to me that he preferred playing this sort of 4-2-3-1 because he did it at Spurs mostly. With a back three, where often one of the players would drop into a back line. Yeah. Um, Eric not, Dyer, I remember. Eric Dyer did that for a lot for Spurs, but he doesn't really have that player, so he doesn't do that with Chelsea. Um, but it seems to be that it's kind of a quite a basic 4 2 3 1. I think the problem isn't less like what the tactics are and what they're trying to do, it's more the cohesion between the players. Okay. Well, I think it's, the, the interesting thing about Chelsea is that their underlying numbers are quite good. I've got them, I think, sixth on the expected goal difference table. So there's been yeah. a lot of questions being like, oh, is this just not a variance thing where. Eventually, over time, you'd expect to see them starting to catch up with the, the sort of numbers they're putting up. Mm. But I do think that there are some really big tactical issues that we're seeing on the field that are contributing to the fact that they are, yes, generating decent chances, not conceding massive chances, but actually repeatedly being able to be pulled apart by, yeah. by smart clubs. I think this is a, a really interesting aspect of like modern elite football because we've talked a lot about how Chelsea have bought a lot of expensive players and throwing them all on the field. When you do that, you are going to get good underlying numbers because you have good players. You are going to generate chances. Um, but I think a lot of what it takes now to be an elite team is to be able to control uh, phases of play as well as generate and prevent chances. So I was going to talk through a few of the problems that I've seen, particularly out of possession from Chelsea, because we've already talked about how they like to press quite high. Mm. When they are out of possession, they'll often push into more of a 4 4 2 shape and they will be super aggressive. Um, up against an opposition press, mm. and the, what, we, what we're seeing happen quite a bit, um, they'll, push, they'll push everyone up, obviously. But what we're seeing happen quite a bit is that they're not giving enough protection for their central midfielders. So um, often we'll ha we'll have one of these central central midfielders pushing forward, um, and and space being created um, ar around the remaining pivot player. So yeah. if they're trying to press around um, a, a team, for example, Liverpool, um, jump up high, try and win the ball back. But if Liverpool get through that initial press then you've got all of this space here just opens out around the central midfielder and then you're running at a central midfielder and a mm. back line, which is... And that's not good, is it, John? Well, on top of that, I think they also get quite horizontally compact as well. So we've seen a few um, situations this season where the same sort of thing has happened, where they've pressed up aggressively on one side. The central midfielders have to pull across to cover. Um, you've got the, the rest of your back four over here. These players are out of commission. So, for example, the, go the goal against Spurs, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, sees the ball go from one side or the other because they get baited forward, squeeze narrow, and then uh, on the other side it gets opened out as well. And then just one final thing that I was going to talk about is that they also have what I would call rest defence issues. Now, rest defence basically just means what are you doing when you're attacking, when you're in possession of the ball, mm. to make sure if you lose the ball you don't have problems. And I think we've seen from Chelsea a lot this season that this sort of same thing has happened as well because, um, yes, I think against some of the better t sides, they're super good at being able to beat the opposition's press and then do this really dynamic, aggressive, direct attacking in channels. So you can think of games against Spurs, uh, games against Man City, where particularly on the right-hand side, they're getting the ball in behind the fullback and then crossing it across to... Uh, Nicholas Jackson mm. to then miss the, the, the goal. Um, <laughs> but what actually happens when they can't do that is that they do this sort of fairly slow uh, build up where they end up in these kind of situations where you get your right back coming forward, everyone else getting into the final line for usually the right back or maybe Cole Palmer drops out and the, and the right back's here. These situations all the time where they're going to swing the ball in, try and generate a chance. But if the ball gets turned over, again, you've got the central midfielder just sitting in this kind of area yeah. uh, and teams are being able to attack, again, this 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 unit with, with very little resistance. So big problems, I think, in terms yeah. of the, the overall tactics. I'm not a football manager, but that seems quite basic. I was expecting you to explain something more complex to me, but I feel like if I was a football manager, I'd have another guy in the middle there. I mean... That's obviously a joke. I don't know what I'm talking about. But hmm. is there any indication from the club or from any of your sources that Pochettino's job, we all think it looks uncertain, is he going to lose his job? Well, the impression we were given before the Carabao Cup final was that win or lose, that competition was not going to move the needle right. in a major way. It felt important as it was happening, though. The way they lost it, yeah. you would have to say, can't have helped him. Um, but... Chelsea are looking at the bigger picture mm. when they're, they will make an evaluation of Pochettino this summer. And there's a, a natural contractual point to do that because he goes into the final guaranteed year of his deal this summer. They have a year option beyond that. But typically in these situations, you either extend a coach or you part ways if you want to go somewhere else. Mm. Um, so there will be a big evaluation and it will be based on where they think the team is going. Is it trending in the right way collectively? I'm sure the issues that you raised will be 
part of that um, and our players individually making development. And that's been another thing I think that Chelsea fans have raised in some of the lower points of this season is that the list of players that are making strides individually doesn't seem to be that long. I mean, Cole Palmer's been good from day one. Mm. He just seems to be good. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, In recent times, I think we've seen, I mean, Conor Gallagher's made real strides. Um, Malo Gusto looks like a very good player. Georgi yeah. Petrovic has been very solid since coming in as a goalkeeper. So the, there are some green shoots individually. I think there's plenty of raw material to work with. Um, but there are tactical issues. I think some of the things that you that you raised as as well, Thiago Silva is a factor in that. Oh. I think you know you, we talk about the midfield, but also the fact that you have a defender whose natural instinct is to step off at this stage of his career rather than step up. Mm -hmm. That's just because he's old and slow. It's because he's worried about being yeah. isolated, and this is why two years ago Thomas Tuchel didn't think he could play Thiago Silva in a back two, right? Uh, in a two-man central defence. Mm. That was the main reason the back three system was designed, was to protect him and to protect Jorginho in front of him, the two yeah. most physically limited Chelsea players. Um, Pochettino has clearly reached a different conclusion, but I think you've seen a, a few times this season, and particularly since Ben Chilwell was fit again. Um, he was playing Levi Colwell at left back for most of the season, I think partly to protect Silva, because Colwell wouldn't go very far forward. Because Chilwell's instinct is to bomb on, I mean, particularly the Wolves game at home a couple of weeks ago, Pedro Neto just ran into that channel, mm. isolated against Silva, and it was absolutely uh, ruthless the way that, you know, it was a, it was a massacre, really. Um, and since Silva has gone out of the team, since Bell Silva called for change on, mm. on, on Twitter, yes. um, and, and he's been out of the team and then injured, I think Chelsea's back line has been able to play a little bit higher up and that's made things a little bit better. But as you say, there are still tactical issues with the way they're set up. Mm. I mean, it's interesting, uh, John, I know that you have prepared a list of players that are good or promising or have been exciting to watch or you feel good about. Uh, I think it's the exact list of four that yeah. Liam yeah. actually spoke about there. But I was going to come to ask you about this because, look, aside from the, the broader structure, whatever happens with Pochettino, one of the things that is is exciting about Chelsea is that they did sign a lot of exciting players to these long-term contracts. They have a lot of young players coming through as well. It's not working for them right now, but I suppose one would hold out hope that it, it will work in the longer term. Which are the, the bright spots? Yeah, I mean, the, the list is massive of players that came in with a claim, and yeah. uh, I've, got, I've just bucketed them into different... Does bucket green mean good? Green means good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of green. <laughs> Yeah, so I've gone through the list, and there's obviously a really big list of exciting players that were brought in. Yeah, uh, I bucketed them into different segments. And what's bucket one? Bucket one is uh, we've got players who struggle to settle, which is what's, a, a give lot us a of them, snappier so. name for bucket one. Uh, uh, flops. Flops. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so at the top, it, the, and the thing here is like money is involved as well. So we're talking Enzo Fernandez, 121 million euros. He's in flops. He, well, I think it's it's only fair to put him at, at, at a level where he hasn't produced in the way that you would expect a player of that amount of money to, yeah. to produce. You agree, Similarly, you agree he's in flops? I think it's harsh, but probably accurate. Yeah. But then a lot of that is going to be the pressure caused by the valuation, as Pochettino has often said. Sure. It's true. And also there's a thing Wenger, when, as Arsene Wenger once said a long time ago, he reckons players from abroad usually need about six months right. to adapt to a new league. It's to do with like changing to a new country, a new uh, manager, yeah. new teammates, let alone being able to just adjust your team and be good. I guess it also depends on the definition between buckets, doesn't it? Mm. We don't know what you the other buckets are You also forced me yet. to say flops. <laughs> I know, I'm yeah. blaming you for this. But yeah. well, players like Moises Caicedo, 116 million euros. Mikhailo you're, saying, you're saying flop. Not produce. Not I'm produce, just putting a finer point on how you think about it. Not producing at the level yeah. that you would expect. Moises Caicedo flop. Mikhailo Modric, I think a lot of people flop. talk about. And there's there's more players further down. We've got even, even players like you know Kaladu Koulibaly, who even remembers him now. They managed sure. to get away with that one. But He's other players just labelled bin. <laughs> bins, yeah. Other players who are, are starting fairly regularly, but I think haven't really hit the level that, again that you would expect them to. So yeah. uh, even players like Nicholas Jackson, Noni Madueke, Rob Sanchez, I've got in there. Maybe uh, I wouldn't call them flops, but I would say again, you're spending a lot of money on players who, yeah. you know, the bar is so low that you're, you're sort of saying, okay, they're still going to start in that starting what, level. What, what would you call them? Um, meh. Meh. Okay, no, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Meh. We then got players who've just been beset with injuries ever since they've come in. So yeah. you know Wesley Fofana, Christopher Nkunku spent sixty million euros on him. Um, we could probably throw Romeo Lavia in there as well. Mm. Um, 
he he also comes in the, the uh, another bucket that I have, which is players we simply haven't seen. Sure. Um, so that's probably not a word, is it? That's probably just the sound. Like <laughs> <a sigh>. Yeah. <sighs> um, so Mark Kukurea, remember him? Uh, and then there's players like David Washington. We spent 60 million euros on him. Obviously, he was one for the future, but he's just. I don't even know who that is. Leslie, <laughs> Leslie Ogachukwu, again, a player that just hasn't, hasn't been seen. And then, yeah, right at the bottom, the players who've had good seasons. Yeah. So we're talking like Cole Palmer, Malagusto, Georgia Petrovic. And Georgia Petrovic is at the bottom of my list because I've sorted by value. So he's a player right. they spent 14 million euros on. Right. And he's the one who's performing well, okay. uh, rather than the players who they've spent upwards of 100 million euros and on. And a bit, a bit of that is relative to expectations, I suppose. But sure. also, well, yeah, uh, I know that you love Cole Palmer, JJ. I mean, he seems terrific, doesn't he? Love is a strong word. Sure. I do think he's a, a good footballer. Though. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the 10 outfield players that they can play. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's been great. I think the thing you see with Cole Palmer is that he takes responsibility when it often will take the ball and make the right decisions with it. He was doing very well for City before um, the season really started, like scored the winner in the Super Cup and also in the Community Shield. Mm. Um, has worked in a very uh, well-run club and academy environment for a long time being part of the first team training for a good couple of years I think would be right at City so he's gone into Chelsea seen it's all over the place and then he's taken his chance mm. and um, I think what you see with a lot of Chelsea players is that they're maybe not they don't have the character that you want on the field right now because they're all looking for leadership from somewhere sure. rather than taking charge but he seems to be like a there's different ways you can categorise leaders he's right? grabbing it he's like a technical leader yeah. but also seems to be like a he sort of motivates people around him by doing things with the ball. He has an aura about him, doesn't he? How the hell did they get him? I don't understand this at all. Why would Man City let him go? Pure profit. Pure profit. To being two words. I know those words are kind of the unofficial mantra of Chelsea, at least in the eyes of people on the outside. But mm. I think it's a consideration for all big clubs. Right. Um, and that's because he was an academy player, and so when they sell him, they yeah. They so can the, the whole Manchester thing. City could bank that forty million pounds straight onto their accounts. It. it more than covers them for signing Jeremy Doku and anything sure. else they want to do around the squad. Yeah. Um, I think it was more of an opportunistic purchase from Chelsea's perspective. They spent most of the summer pursuing Michael Elise. As much as Chelsea have signed a lot of left-footed right-wingers over the last year or so, mm -hmm. um, I don't think you'd necessarily go for Elise and Palmer. Sure. Um, so when that fell through, the timing worked in terms of Palmer was was looking for more game time. Mm. And I think City at that point made it clear to him that he wasn't going on loan, that he would either stay or be sold. Yeah. And so Chelsea saw an opportunity. There's a link there with Joe Shields, who was uh, in academy recruitment at City for a long time, knows Palmer very, very well. Mm. And so Chelsea made, made a big move. And I think um, City were ultimately happy with the price they got. But Chelsea very, very happy with the player they got. And... I think Palmer has probably exceeded expectations given that while he showed really good flashes for City, he played almost no first team football for He was just breaking in age. at the end. Yeah, yeah. He, he was really... But when you compare his minutes to you know, Phil Foden, Rico, Lewis, he was, he was behind all of those guys despite mm. being older. So the fact that he's been able to come in and be so dependable, that, that's the thing that stands out for me about him at Chelsea is that He's played mainly from the right wing, but occasionally as a 10, occasionally as a 9, even as an 8 on, on, on occasion from the bench. Yeah. And wherever he plays, he rarely makes a wrong decision with or without the ball. He, he moves into the right areas. He plays the right passes at the right time with the mm. right weight, which is revolutionary at Chelsea. <laughs> mm. um, and he's really become the brain of this attack in a very short space of time. John, is there any way that you could formally quantify what Liam is saying? Yeah, well, I think what's really interesting that what you're talking about is that he is a producer as well as a goal scorer. Um, so I've used uh, FB Ref stat head query tool to, to have a look at shot creating actions. Mm. Um, so I'm looking across the top five uh, leagues in Europe to, to see the players who are best for shot creating actions, just sort of searching through forwards. When we search for that, we can see that Cole Palmer shows up 43 on the list of forwards in terms of shot creating actions with 78. And from many fewer games than a lot of other players around him, he's only got 17 right. full 90. So much smaller sample size, but is, is generating those chances for his teammates. Mm. Okay. And the other player that I want to talk about, we've mentioned a number of them already. Moises Caicedo, he was the, the huge signing of last summer. Very exciting. Everyone enjoyed watching him play at Brighton. Which bucket's he in? Well, yeah, he was in the flop bucket, but again, because of the amount of money that was spent on him. Yeah. But I think what's really... It's a big bucket. 
it, it, it's a big bucket and could fit many players in at Chelsea. Yeah. But I, I think what's so interesting about Moises Caicedo is that he's moved from a team where they had a very clear tactical identity in Brighton to a, a team where, as we've shown, doesn't really have a, a stronger tactical identity and also has big areas of weakness, which I think have caused him to be exposed in, in ways that he wasn't at Brighton. So yeah. I'm just going to talk through a few of those right now. So we already talked about how Chelsea, really aggressive high press, and if they lose the ball or if the press gets broken, then they're, they're leaving the, the central midfielder exposed. So this is from the actually the Carabao Cup final, I think. So you can see here, Chelsea have been trying to press high on Liverpool. Liverpool have squeezed the ball through the press, and we can see now we've got four Liverpool players here. Uh, Moises Caicedo just completely exposed he can they can play the ball either way around him quite comfortably get at the, the back four yeah. so we're seeing there's a clear example of him being exposed um, we talked as well about the fact that not only are Chelsea pressing high but they they're quite compact um, uh, horizontally in their press as well so you can see here Chelsea have push, pushed high against Spurs and, and we're going to see um, this is Van der Ven he's going to play the ball to Madison who's dropped out and because Madison's dropped out we can see this is the two midfielders for Chelsea they have to pull right across onto the side of the field leaving space on the far side of the field. And now Madison's able to play the ball across to Saar, who's then able to play the ball into Kulusevski, who then goes and scores. So again, you can see in this situation, um, if we go back to the screen, we can see this is Caicedo. He has had to come right across the field to cover um, for the fact that the press is so aggressive and that yeah. has opened space up on the, on the other side and that results in a goal. And then the rest defensive issues that we talked about as well. So this is Chelsea attacking. I think this is from the 4-1 defeat to Liverpool in the league. This is Desazi who's playing as the fullback here, which we could talk about that as well. But again, what I'm saying is that in certain situations when they're not able to uh, build up super direct, mm. um, they, they end up getting into these scenarios where opposition sit in their low block and Chelsea have to try and break them down somehow. Yeah. And what we're seeing here is everyone has pushed into that final line. So these are the two midfielders here. So we've got Enzo and Conor Gallagher. So giving no protection to, to Caicedo here. Here's Cole Palmer. He's going to drop across here to help out Desazi so that he's got another option to get the ball in. If the ball is lost here and you can get forward quickly, again, you're seeing the same thing happening with Caicedo just being completely mm. exposed here. This is from that same game. This is a scenario where actually when their build-up breaks down, again, their rest defence doesn't function well enough to give him the protection. So this resulted in the first goal in that game. Ben Chilwell had the ball in this area, lost it. And as you can see, immediately Liverpool are able to get into this situation where they're running at the back line and Caicedo has no support whatsoever. So okay. he's moved from a, a team in, in Brighton where the, the way that they defend is actually quite different. They have fullbacks who invert when they get further down the field, just gives them a little bit more protection in the middle. And often both of their central midfielders will stay deeper. Mm. Um, but also in terms of the, the build-up side of things as well, which we could get into a little bit more. But with Brighton, really structured, automised um, build up ideas mm. where you'll repeat, you're, you've got the same players in the same positions, the same patterns repeated and repeated and repeated. And that's, that's helping Caicedo out of Brighton. Whereas at Chelsea, it feels like they, they are very good, as I've said, at doing these sort of small, quick passing rondos where they can get through front lines of, of press, but then they move really quickly into, into the wide channels. Mm. But that's a lot more ad hoc. It's a lot more players around the ball, just working, so problem solving themselves and then, and then moving. So again, I think that this is a, a change of system for Caicedo, which has meant that he's not actually getting, they're not getting the most out of him that we saw in his previous team. Yeah. One, one loose barometer for how balanced or unbalanced Chelsea can look, I found just from watching the games, is the distance between Caicedo and Enzo. Mm -hmm. Enzo's positioning has, has shifted at, at different times of the season. And it seemed like a few weeks ago, Pochettino went back to, to playing him ahead of the ball when Chelsea had it. And as, as you referenced there, there are times when him and Conor Gallagher can look almost like two eights mm -hmm. ahead of one sitting midfielder in Caicedo. And it means that when the ball is lost, Enzo doesn't have the speed to mm -hmm. get back. Um, I mean, most Premier League teams can counter faster than that anyway. And like you say, it means that Caicedo, who I think had smaller spaces at Brighton to cover has got this vast expanse of midfield mm. a lot of the time and I think he's had nine bookings this season mm -hmm. um, that's another indicator of him just having maybe to do a little bit too much to try and yeah. balance this team whereas when he, him and Enzo have been close together it's been easier for them to keep the ball but also despite Enzo's defensive limitations he can do a little bit more it shows up really well on the screen here because this is this is the goal against uh, that Liverpool scored in the 4-1 win 
And what we see is a rotation. So we see Enzo going into the front line. Uh, and that's obviously something that Pochettino encourages. He likes his players to switch positions. Um, that means that Gallagher drops a little bit deeper. But when the ball gets turned over, Gallagher almost acts as though he is the more advanced midfielder and he doesn't make a huge effort to get back. Mm. Enzo is now so far out of position, there's no chance of him getting back. Mm. So, yeah, yes... Caicedo is exposed at this moment when the ball's turned over. But when you fast forward, they're, they're not even across the halfway line. If you fast forward to the actual time the goal scored, neither of these two players comes back into, into shot on the, on the TV footage. So clearly, you know, the, the, the aggressive positioning of the players is, is leaving him exposed. And I think this is my big question with Pochettino, is that he, he almost feels as though he's playing an aggressive form of football that you could get away with five, six, seven years ago in the Premier League. You can't do that now because teams mm. are so smart at picking up these weaknesses and then exploiting them. Well, speaking of the uncertainty around his future, there is another coach that uh, has been regularly linked with the Premier League job at some point uh, or at points over the last year, uh, and that's Ruben Amarim. And uh, we're going to hear now from Alex Barker what he thinks about whether he could be a fit for Chelsea. Thanks, Joe. Let's cut straight to it. There's plenty of big teams looking for a new manager this summer, so we're going to be hearing Ruben Amarin's name a lot over the coming months. So, how good are his sporting side, and is he up to the level of an aspiring elite Premier League team like Chelsea? Let's start with a quick catch-up. Amarin joined sporting in 2020 and from the very start played a 3-4-3 formation. He won the club's first league title in 19 years. He's developed some top players, and at the time of recording, sporting a one game in hand away from going top of the table. So, some pretty positive signs, but if we want to know how successful Amarin might be in the Premier League, we need to look a little deeper. Let's start with what Sporting do when they have the ball. After all, one of the biggest challenges top Premier League teams face is breaking down deep sitting defences. So, how does Amarim approach this, and would it still work if he was at a club like Chelsea? In possession, Sporting tend to line up in this 3-1-6 shape, with a flat back three, high and wide fullbacks, a main striker flanked by narrow forwards. The midfield though is a little more complex. Sporting often use one of the midfielders, usually Hidemasa Morita, to pull wide to help form wide triangles. But it's also not uncommon to see him push very far centrally, often leaving Morten Hulmund in the middle on his own. Now, Sporting are the league's top scorers, with their striker, Victor Jokeresh, leading the way across the division. So Amarim's attacking ideas are pretty good then, right? Well, no, it's not that simple. Sporting have overperformed their expected goals by nearly 13. In fact, on paper, their attack is closer to Braga than title rivals Benfica. And individual player quality could be a big factor in this overperformance. For one, Jokeres is excellent. His ball striking makes him a dangerous forward who can get powerful shots on goal with very little backlift. Secondly, Sporting are able to create a surplus of chances for him because they're pushing so many players forward. Now, in a league where 14 of the 18 teams have a squad value below 50 million euros, individual player quality makes a telling impact. Sporting can often afford to be this top heavy without repercussions. But in the Premier League, where the difference in quality is much less pronounced, you're more likely to get punished for being this expansive. And these red flags continue into what Sporting do without the ball. Amarim side press in a 3-4-3, and they like to keep this front line in line or even ahead of the ball. So if Sporting win the ball back, they're in a more advantageous attacking position. However, this places a huge burden on their midfielders to step up and cover an enormous amount of space, especially for the opposition pull players deeper and Sporting's defenders are unable to step up so far. Let's revisit their most recent league game against Benfica. Benfica have taken a short goal kick as Sporting's front three is set up to press. Partey here, he's blocked the pass to the right, so Benfica have moved it to the left. Uh, the ball's coming to their left back right now. As the defender controls the ball, his teammate is going to pull wide to provide a passing option and it's down to Morita to track him. But this movement has created an enormous amount of space in the midfield, leaving Sporting's defence almost completely unprotected. But once again, this space went unpunished. Benfica hit the ball long rather than exploiting this weakness. Now, Sporting do have impressive underlying defensive numbers. And credit should be given to Amarim for consistently coaching players like Ogarte, Palinha and Hulman for being able to cover these large spaces effectively. But imagine you're at Chelsea where Caicedo and Fernandes are already struggling in a midfield too. Were they to play in Amarim's system, they would likely face the same issues they're already struggling with. And that's the key question. If Amarim was to move to a Premier League team that wants to win trophies like Liverpool or Chelsea? Would he curb these attacking instincts to minimise their current problems? Or would he stick to his guns, creating a team that could get punished in a punishing league? While we can't say for certain, based off what we've seen, perhaps elite teams should think twice before approaching Amarim to be the next manager. And instead, he may be more suited to a developing team where there's more room to make mistakes.
What do you think of Alex's assessment? Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to what he says. And I think the reason why so many people are impressed with him is because they tend to watch him in Champions League football, which yeah. is obviously uh, sporting go in as, as underdogs in, in a lot of their games. Um, and so they're going to be sitting deeper and then trying to hit on, on the break. And um, I think we've, we've seen Chelsea do that this season with mixed results. But I think what Chelsea will probably want from their next manager is um, what we see from more of the uh, coaches right at the, uh, the elite end now, which is being able to control in, in every phase of play. So mm. I agree with Alex. I think it's a massive risk to bring in someone like Amarim um, and expect that to then translate into a, a nice project for the future because there is that risk involved. Is there another coach out there that you think would be a good fit? In your vast experience of running a football <laughs> In my extensive scouting that I've been <laughs> undertaking in the, in the last few months. It's a really difficult question that, that, that will confront Chelsea if they decide to part yeah. with Pochettino because... It's hard to know where they would go. Yeah, not, not only is it hard to identify the type of coach that you, to you talked about there and the kind of coach that can deliver. I mean, the bar for success in the Premier League is as high as it gets. It's the two greatest coaches of this generation. Mm -hmm. And Mikel Arteta is, is rising with Arsenal as well. So it, it's really, really hard to get to the top of this league and be tactically sophisticated enough to stay there. Um, but even if they can identify who that coach is, whether it's Amarim, whether it's Xabi Alonso or, or anyone else, who might be the, the pep or the clop of the next generation, why would Chelsea be their best option? That's, that's the reality of where they are right now. You, if you decide to get rid of Pochettino this summer, mm. you will be hiring from a position of objective weakness because of where you are in the league and not being able to offer Champions League football, but also relative weakness because it's a summer when Liverpool, when Bayern, maybe other big European clubs we don't know yet could have vacancies yeah. and, and be in significantly better health than, than Chelsea. And as the Chelsea owners, you would also be pitching a new manager on a, on a project when you've already sacked two project coaches. Yeah. So it, how, how difficult does that conversation become as well? Mm. I think it's a really, really hard one for them to answer. And that's a really long way of saying that I don't have a Scooby <laughs> of who the next Chelsea coach should be. It's a, it's a really good point, JJ. And also, even if they were to let Pochettino go and bring someone else in, the problems are huge, aren't they? I mean, where would they even start? Well, the, I mean, the problem they've got is that, well, Pochettino especially, is that he's trying to foster, a, to build a team spirit and a cohesive idea of how to play with a bunch of players, too many players to possibly do it with. So, mm. I mean, if you look at, um, uh, when, like, like we normally do, the legal class size limit for children in England and Wales is 30. Right. And he's had it for a long time, like 35, 36, 37 players. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to keep everyone happy. Um, back to like the Arsene Wenger quote I used before where he says that it takes six months to adapt. He also reckons you can only really put in about three key players into a team, otherwise you disrupt the harmony. Right. And like clubs will spend years and th like hundreds of thousands of pounds, millions of pounds, trying to identify what their key players are and make sure they keep this like identity of part of their team and then add to it. So you only do three at a time. You look at clubs who've done it in the past. Newcastle, when they started having money in building, Eddie Howe signed like three or four key players per window at the very start. But he also signed players who are from the Premier League, so it, it immediately was cohesive. Yeah. So they didn't have to do too much adapting to a new country or anything like that. You can have yeah. that in. And things like Real Madrid, who are serial winners, they've kept a core of players from when they've won stuff then they bring in youngsters as they start to get older, so they learn it. And then by the time those ones retire, like now you've got Modric, Cruz mm. at the end of their careers, you've got the ones coming through below who are already playing while they're still there. Yeah. And uh, they've had that for years. That took a long time to happen, and that's when they end up getting over the line with the decimate and things like that. Now at Chelsea, what you've had in the past was uh, lots of winning and lots of managers changing, lots of stuff like that, so you know that. But if you look at the 16-17 team when Antonio Conte came in and made them amazing, they were really good. Halfway through that season's when he changed to that 3-4-3 three, three, that they became... I think largely associated with. Look at the kind of star players they had. They had star players like Hazard and Diego Costa and all these lads. That's for the Quetta, really important. David mm. Luiz even was good. Uh, Cahill was, uh, not Tim Cahill. Going to call him Gary, Tim Cahill. Yeah, because I was thinking <laughs> of Tim Cahill. <laughs> Gary Cahill, who is not related, is uh, was here. So you got all these players here. Fabregas was mostly a substitute. I think he did half and half, actually, yeah. in that year. But you had core players. And, and like fairly long-serving players as well, right? Yeah, and they've come off the back of having players like um, John Terry and Ivanovic yeah. and all the lads who won the things. Ashley Cole. Ashley Cole, all the lads who won the things, they sort of passed the baton on. So you're passing yeah. on 
not just the cores there, but you're passing on the winningness of it. I believe they call it a baton. Uh, I've heard that too, mm. but only in certain countries. Mm. Now, what you have here is Chelsea four years later, they've got Azpilicueta, Kante and Alonso are the only ones left from that title-winning winning machine that Conte built, and you go through a few different changes with Sarri and different people that come in and out. Yeah. So then all these players have gone, so you've lost this. This is the core they've got. So I think they've been in a bit of trouble for a little bit longer than we maybe think. Yeah. And then you come to, uh, this is the Champions League winning final team. This is what they have. The only two core ones are Kante and Spilicueta. Now, Tuchel that season we took over from Lampard, because they were, I think Lampard made a dis disastrous few decisions with his recruitment that kind of set them back a lot. But also losing these guys on the right was really the key. So what you've got now is the core is here. Tuchel got into second, I think, that season, maybe third. They did very well. And then the second season when Tuchel was there, was that when it started to fall apart, Liam, or was it slightly after? So his, he had one full season at Chelsea, and the first half of it was really good. Yeah. They were, I think, top around Christmas time. Um, and then it all started to go wrong because it was basically only the first 12 months of Tuchel the, f the final half of the Champions League winning campaign and the first half of the following season when they really defended at an elite best well, in the world level. That makes sense because Lampard was, I think, terrible with rest defence and uh, anything to do with stopping teams playing through them. So they were very good attacking, lots of chaos, so they were fun, but they conceded heaps of goals. Then Tuchel comes in, sorts out the defensive part. They still have some of the fun and the chaos up front from Lampard uh, without the structure that Tuchel puts in because that takes time and you need pre-season and things like that to put your ideas really in, I would say. And so then Tuchel next season, very defensive, very demanding, very intense. Tuchel can't be that fun to work to work under. <laughs> All uh, of the attackers hated him. Well, <laughs> and you look at like Bayern Munich now. You know the problem they've got is lack of freedom, creativity, and um, lack of Tuchel. Well, 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 he's still there. Yeah, but he's on his way. Well, that's right. He leaves <laughs> in the summer. I just tried to say I thought it would be you know, but it didn't work. All makes sense. Add. <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to be involved. I just wanted to say something. Yeah. So what you have here, and I see that the the two. Who are the key ones here? Kante and Nespoliqueta were key in that Champions League final. Obviously, Havertz comes in and scores the winner. That's how they beat Man City in the final. Alonso's on the bench. So they've got this as the last remnants of there. And you've got players like Mount coming through. Um, I don't think Gallagher was even in there because he was coming through the youth system. But you've got all these players on the bench. Even some of these, Juru was sort of around for some of the fun. Mm -hmm. So you can count him as maybe a legacy player. But this yeah. is what I've got. Now, this is what you've got now. Now they signed 18 million players. Now this is the team that played the League Cup final. Now what you see here is that all these players who are the sort of legacy ones who helped them win stuff have all gone wherever they've gone into to various bins. Mm -hmm. What you have here is, don't really know which the goalkeeper is. It's probably Petrovic now, but you don't really know. It's a really important position. Mm -hmm. uh, they only have one yep. at one time, They're allowed as one. we've established. Mm. Now the defenders, you've got these things here. Chilwell's the only one who played. James is always injured. Silva is uh, too slow maybe, or doesn't want to play in, this high, in a high line, so they've got too much space vertically. So it affects the tactical system. Then you've got things that John's talking about that don't make sense in the midfield, but everyone's trying to learn each other. Everyone's trying to learn how to play. Everyone's trying to learn how Pochettino wants to play, trying to foster it all at once. It yeah. takes long. And so they're starting to look a bit more like a team now, I'd say. And if you look at, I mean, Arteta for a long time was linked with being getting sacked. Um, the Klopp won things instantly, but it was three key players each time that made them better. Mm. Howe came in, made them a bit better, improved some players, but they signed key players from the Premier League straight away, and they built on that. Bruno Guimaraes should be the only exception immediately they brought in. And what Chelsea have done is they got rid of a bunch of players who were already quite good, and brought in ones who are pretty much exactly the same. Their FIFA rating's gone down half a star, actually. <laughs> from a billion pounds to do that. And so this is what you have, but the important bit is they've basically got rid of what most elite clubs want to build, which yeah. is a core of elite players who they can pass the baton on to. And they've only really got Chilwell and James left now. Okay. I mean, we hear a lot how important a core is. It seems that, that their core is sort of evacuated. John, the, the title of this video is When, when Will They Be Good? Um, I think what we've heard are all of the reasons why they're not good right now. When will they be good? Yeah, I think there's a few things that I want to see before I believe that Chelsea are going to become good. One of them is I think they need to have a sporting director who has clear control over the future of the club. At the moment they have two guys in charge, I believe, um, Paul Win Winstanley and Lawrence. Lawrence Stewart. Stewart, yeah. yeah. Those guys always seem to be in the background. They don't seem to play a, a big role in terms of actually um, presenting a game model, a tactical identity that they want to see on the pitch, which they can then use to employ coaches and players to fit. feels like their logic has been the other way around. It's been, we have this, this sort of financial idea where we can bring in players, let's get in exciting players for the future, which we can find these financial loopholes to make it financially viable. Um, but when it comes to the, the on-pitch stuff, then you don't really have that overarching idea of a project or a tactical identity that, that is, is in place. And I think until Chelsea reach the point where they're able to do that and say, 
no, this, this is what we want our team to look like on the field. Mm. It doesn't matter what you're doing off the field because yeah. it will never work out. Okay. I think that's a really good point, actually, in that Chelsea are still in the process of developing a football philosophy. The first thing that they implemented was a financial philosophy, which was turning the squad into an investment portfolio. Mm. That's what it is. They've got all these young players mostly under the age of 23 on hyper-long contracts. They don't expect them all to be good or succeed, but they're, it's a numbers game. More will go up in value than down over time, and we'll see. It will take a long time for us to be able to judge that, really, from the outside. Mm. What we know right now is that the early stages of it are extremely painful on a, on a football level. Mm. Um, but now they need to start building that football philosophy, and they need to make a decision on whether Pochettino is part of that. Because that that's the key decision they face now and beyond that I think it's probably going to be more of an extension of what we saw in January maybe not no transfers but scaled back transfers surgical recruitment in terms of what do we need in certain positions mm. what sort of profile of player do we need to, to flesh out this group and finding out what you have with the group that you've got you've got all these yeah. players that's kind of exciting to be honest yeah, it, I think a lot of teams will just you know will just bring in a transfer in order to fix any old problem. But if they stick to their guns of, we spent heavy early on, you stick with it now. Maybe the coach changes, but like the, the players will, will have to adapt, I suppose. I think there is an exciting core in that squad. It just hasn't emerged yet. But there, you look yeah. at guys like Levi Colwell, Conor Gallagher if they don't sell him. <laughs> yeah. But you know, Enzo and Caicedo are clearly earmarked to be part of that. They just need to figure out how that works. Um, so they... they the components are there, it just hasn't really coalesced into anything that mm. is ready to succeed on a weekly basis in the Premier League yet. When will they be good? Um, if they stick with Pochettino, then it could be in two, three years. Mm -hmm. You'd have to go through that process the same way that Arsenal, Liverpool, Newcastle are going through it with their managers. Um, if he'd won the League Cup, that would have been pretty good. That it would bought him a bit good. of time. Yeah. Bought Arteta time when he won the FA Cup. Yeah. And they weren't very fun to watch for a long time, Arsenal. Well, Chelsea's still in the FA Cup, of course. Yeah, they could win that. They could. Yeah. I mean, stranger things have happened. So, yes. Well, when will they be good? Three years. Three years. That's the answer. <laughs> is, that true? is that right? If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including David Ornstein, Amy Lawrence and Rafa Honigstein. With the latest transfer news and insight on every Premier League story that matters, theathletic.com puts you inside football and you can try it free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.